All right, uh, we're continuing with uh, graph colorability. We just proved that uh, graph three colorability is NP complete, even if you restrict the degree to be maximum four, which is kind of surprising because degree zero, one, and two becomes trivial to do efficiently if uh, you talk about colorability of smaller degree, max degree graphs. Uh, and now we're going to turn our attention to planar graphs. So it turns out planar graph three colorability is still NP complete even though it's a very specific restricted uh, class of graphs. Most graphs are not planar, simply because planar graphs have a linear number of edges in the number of nodes at most three, actually. Uh, number of edges at most three times the number of nodes. Uh, and most graphs you know, can have up to a quadratic number of edges in general. So very small class of graphs, but it's still NP-complete to uh, try to three color them. So to prove this, we're going to use a planarity preserving gadget uh, the way this gadget will work, it looks like this. It's a little more complicated than the previous gadget we saw for uh, max degree four, uh, three color ability. And this gadget has the following properties. It's planar, obviously, no edges crossing. I'm drawing it in the plane like that. It's three colorable. How do we know? Because here's a three coloring. The coloring is not unique. There's many other three colorings. But in any three coloring, opposite corners will get the same color. Um, and by opposite quarter, I mean this pair will have the same color as each other, and this pair will have the same color as each other, but not necessarily the same color as the first pair. They could be two different colors. So how will you prove something like that, that in any three coloring opposite corners get the same color? Remember the diamond color propagation constraints that we saw earlier? So if you have um, this color colorability constraint propagation across diamonds, so here is a, uh, a diamond here. Remember, topologically, it doesn't have to look exactly like that. It could be a little skewed. So this color will be the same as that color. How many get that? Because that's the opposite corners of the same diamond. And this color will propagate over here because there's a diamond, and there's another diamond for that matter. Um, so whatever color you paint this, now we could bifurcate. This could be either uh, red or green, take your choice. So we'll make it green, and then in the next iteration, we'll look for the red painting of this color. But once you do that, other constraints kind of fall into place. These two colors force this to be red, because it ain't going to be blue. It ain't going to be green, because it has green and blue as neighbors. So, And in the other case, same as we had before, we'll make this red, and we'll chase this down separately as, a, as an alternative. But these two force this to be red, and now a whole bunch of forced uh, colorings are taking effect like dominoes. This red, this green make this force to be blue. And now this being blue, this being green, this forces that one to be red, and so on and so on. You can just keep chasing the colors around the periphery. And the rest of the choices are constrained by the existing choices. These two forces to be red, this, this force this to be blue, and so on and so on. And look at what happened. Everything got three colorized. But these two opposite nodes got the same color green. These two opposite nodes got the same color blue. Now we chase the other situation where this is red. And again, everything is begin to be forced. These two chase this to be green. These two force this to be blue. These two force to be red. These two force this one to be green. And again, you get the same thing, except opposite colors now are all the same. But it's still the same property, that opposite colors are the same as each other. It just happens to be the same as the other opposite pair which doesn't negate the original property. The opposite um, nodes in this gadget must, must acquire the same color in any valid three coloring. So that gadget has this property. And the opposite quarters are therefore independent. These two are the same as each other, and these two are the same as each other, but they don't certainly have to be the same across the two pairs. Okay. Uh, so that's an interesting set of properties. You'll see in a second how it's used to prove that you can always change a non-planar graph into a planar graph using these kind of gadgets in a way that preserves the colorability and doesn't change the colorability, and if and only if. The original graph will be three colorable, if and only if the morphed graph will be three colorable, except the morphed graph will be planar. OK, so uh, with that gadget in mind, here's how you use them to eliminate intersections and convert a graph to being planar. So here's a. Here's a non-planar embedding of a graph. Now, it just so happens that this graph is also planar if you use a different embedding. 
Right? You can take this node and like put it over here, or take this edge and draw it around the long way. But let's just leave it like that. And so the two culprits are here, the two edge crossings that we have here are right there. So what we'll do is local substitution using this gadget. So for this edge crossing right here, what we'll do is locally replace the edge crossing with this gadget that we saw on the previous slide. So here's this gadget here, and another copy of the gadget will be there. And we reconnect these edges to uh, the opposite corners. So instead of having this cross here, we're going to uh, connect to only the ends of the gadget, the opposite corners like this. This will go here. This will go. And by the way, you can use a diamond to uh, preserve the color constraints as well, to, to avoid the color constraints. So we don't, want a, we don't want a color constraint conflicting between this one and that one because it was a straight edge. So this is blue. We want this to be blue. And this propagation across the gadget will force this to be blue because opposite nodes have the same color. And the, the color constraints blue will keep propagating forward across the gadget, th right through the gadget, which is the whole point of the gadget. So once we connect it like this um, and replace here locally also these edges like that, uh, this new graph is planar, but it's three colorable if and only if the original graph was three colorable because colorability constraints pass right through the gadget as if the gadget wasn't there. So if this was green, this is green, and this is green, and then this red node sees a green as if it was connected to the original green because the colors were propagating across the gadget in the appropriate way. Um, so once you do that, and it's a local transformation, it's a polynomial time transformation, how do we know? Because you haven't added more than a linear number of new nodes and edges by adding all these gadgets. Right? As a gadget is only a constant number of nodes and edges, and you only add it when you have an intersection. And you can have only as many intersections as you have edges in the original graph, which is polynomial in the number of nodes in the original graph. So you're only adding a polynomial number of new edges and nodes. So it's a polynomial transformation. And it preserves three colorability. So in this abstract diagram that we saw all along, some language A transforms to language B using some transformation function f, this polynomial time, in a way that preserves members to members and maps non-members to non-members. This is the instantiation of f in this specific case. Bottom line, solving planar graph colorability is just as hard or as easy as solving arbitrary graph colorability without any planarity constraints. Uh, how many get this proof? OK, any questions about this? Yeah. Uh, right, yeah, we're changing the degree of the graph, but all we've done is is made it planar. So we create a new so 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 we so it's not you know, saying made it planar is a bit of a misnomer. We change it into a planar graph, into a different planar graph, in such a way that preserves three colorability. They both are three colorable, or neither is, neither are three colorable. So if we had a solver that can solve only planar graph colorability. This is how we can exploit it into solving arbitrary graph colorability for us. In other words, the three colorability of planar graphs is not any easier than arbitrary graphs. Because you can always substitute in, into an arbitrary graph these gadgets that will force it to be planar in a way that preserves its three colorability. It's an if and only if. Uh, which makes planar graph colorability NP complete because this reduces all of NP into planar graph colorability through regular graph colorability. And the way we got graph colorability in general to be NP complete is by reduction from SAT. And the way all of NP reduced to SAT, that's as Cook's theorem. Um, so composing all these transformations reduces all of SAT into planar graph colorability. And by the way, when I say Cook's theorem, I mean the Cook-Levine theorem. I don't want to shortchange Levine. It was shortchanged enough by getting overlooked historically, and he probably deserved the Turing Award along with Cook, but that's how life works. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the Wien was Russian, and it was hard to get to the Soviet Union in those days, or even read their publications, and it would have been a great collusion, I mean collaboration, if, if they only have met and uh, you know, not, not been unknown to each other for over a decade. 
Um, but I digress. Any any other questions or comments on this? Uh, so it's a it, again, it's a gadget-based proof. It's by local replacements. We just proved that graph colorability for planar graphs is NP-complete. Um, and uh, now we proved separately that graph colorability is NP-complete for max degree four graphs, and separately that it's NP-complete for planar graphs. Now, what about planar graphs that are max degree four at the same time? Because some of these graphs here may not be max degree four. Like, look at the degree here. The degree here is five on this red node, right? And it could have been higher than that. Um, so what if graphs are, are supposed to be only max degree four and planar at the same time? How many say it's still NP-complete, even with this double restriction? Yeah. Why? Composition. Composition. Yeah. One word proofs. I love it. Composition. Uh, and how, what do you mean by composition? Well, what it means is that you can take a, um, a non-planar graph and replace it by local you know, replacements with these gadgets to make it planar. And then whenever you have degree more than five, like here, or more than four even, use the other gadget from the other proof to change the degree to a lower degree, max, max degree four. So here's this other gadget from the previous proof from an hour ago. Uh, and you keep doing this, and you may have to do this elsewhere as well. But whenever the degree is higher than five, like like here and here and other places, replace it by that gadget. Now you have finally a graph with max degree four and planar as well, and it has a property that it's three colorable, even only if the original graph is three colorable. So uh, that's that's pretty good. Which means you can you know take this highly restricted version of graph colorability, and it's still NP-complete. Um, and that's kind of a typical trend with NP-complete problems. Uh, even smaller, more restricted versions of them are still NP-hard and NP-complete and not any easier than the original. But at some point, if you reduce all the parameters enough, they trivialize. Right? If you make the degree at most 0 or 1 or even 2, we saw how that could be solved very quickly in polynomial time. Uh, so uh, any, any questions about any of this? Okay, so you can compose these reductions, and nice thing about polynomials, they compose to yield other polynomials, so it, it's all still polynomial transformation. Now, a few more things about graph colorability. Uh, planar graph one colorability is trivial. A graph is one colorable if and only if what is true. Max degree zero, no edges, in other words. And that's easy to determine in linear time, right? If there's edges there or not. So that was easy. Uh, planar two colorability, planar graph two colorability is also relatively easy. A graph, a planar graph is two colorable if and only if no odd cycles. Okay, so that was easy. Planar graph three colorability is already NP complete, and I'll let you, uh, you know, figure out why. Now, it turns out that planar graph 4 colorability is easy again. I shouldn't say easy, but it comes from a very deep theorem. That's what makes it easy. But the theorem is very deep. The theorem says that every planar graph is 4 colorable. That's not easy at all to prove. It took, it took almost two centuries to prove that one to, to, to all of mathematics. All planar graphs have four colorings. That's, it's been open since 1852 and was only solved in the 1970s, a hundred century plus later. And even then, the proof was thousands and thousands of pages long. It was a computer-generated proof. Some mathematicians even argued that it's not a valid proof because only a computer can follow, only the computer can generate the proof, and only another computer can follow the proof and verify it. Humans are out of the loop at that point, other than they have written the software that does both tasks, generating the proof and separately, verifying the proof. Uh, but it's been suspected for a long, long time that four colors suffice to paint any planar graph. And it comes from map coloring, actually. Car cartographers over the centuries always wondered, for any map that you can draw on a plane, like here's the map of all the states of the United States, or any other map for that matter, counties in any state or whatever, is it possible to paint it with only four colors such that no two adjacent regions share the same color? So it's very clear where the borders are. You don't get color confusion across borders. 
Um, it turns out that's true. Uh, and even today, the number of cases, special cases that the proof um, uh, resorts to has been reduced greatly, but it's still probably hundreds of cases. It's probably still not even dozens. And we don't have any more elegant or short or succinct or insightful proof than just this brute force case by case analysis. Uh, any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, well, why? Because we just don't know how. Uh, uh, it just uh, it, it didn't yet lend itself to anything more insightful than a brute force attack. Uh, and there are a number of other proofs in mathematics that involve kind of brute force frontal assaults on the on, on the on the on the theorem. Um, sometimes you get lucky, and a few decades later, or even centuries later. Uh, somebody comes up with a more elegant proof, more insightful proofs. Uh, but for these apparently simple problems, um, there's still no elegant proofs. For some of them, there's no proofs at all. Like the 3x plus 1 problem, there's no proof. Um, uh, sphere packing in 3D, you know, whether the best way to stack oranges in the grocers is this, you know, uh, lattice. Um, structure that every orange is touching 12 other oranges, six on the plane and then three above and three below. That was open for almost three centuries. It's called Kepler's problem, you know, sphere packing. Um, and that's all been solved recently, and the proof for that is very complicated also. And it seems like, a, like it should be simple, uh, but it isn't. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's hard to guess uh, what problem you know, what problems will yield to easy, insightful, simple, ins con you know, ins incisive solutions and which ones will just require brute force approaches. But with the passage of time, sometimes it flips and uh, you get more beautiful proofs over time, especially when new mathematical techniques and tools are developed that weren't available back then. You know, so, so Pierre Fermat, when he said, I have this wonderful proof that won't fit in the margin, probably didn't, simply because you know, when Andrew Weil proved it finally after three and a half centuries, he used entire math new mathematical techniques that he and others had developed simply to try to attack this problem. And those tools were not available. Those fields of mathematics, subfields of areas of mathematics, did not exist three centuries before then. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to second guess these things. Uh, and remember Gödel's theorem. Some, some statements, some, some true theorems, have no proofs at all. Never mind easy proofs, never mind even complicated proofs. The proofs for some theorems just don't exist even. So it can, get, can be arbitrarily bad in terms of trying to find proofs. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Is the same example for the reason trivial for all the manifolds? Yeah, so I have, I have uh, a slide on that, actually. Very good question. So the post, even the US Post Office used a, a, a stamp canceling uh, uh, um, cancellation uh, logo during that year, 1976, four colors suffice. So that, that's how famous the problem was, that the federal government used to stamp uh, this, this theorem on, on envelopes to cancel stamps in that year, 1976. Our government was much smarter back then. But anyway, I digress again. Um, so finding planar graph four colorings you can do in quadratic time. Even though you know they exist for planar graphs, finding them is not necessarily easy. By easy, I mean linear time. So that's a theorem. Uh, finding planar graph five colorings you can do in linear time, it turns out. Now, these are upper bounds. Uh, maybe you could do four colorings in less than quadratic. We just don't know how. But if you allow the flexibility of using five colors, not just the minimum four, you have more leeway and it's easier to find in linear time rather than quadratic time. Uh, you can actually test whether a graph is planar in linear time. That was a famous theorem by Lipton and Dopkin back in the 70s. That wasn't uh, an obvious algorithm, no, it's a complicated algorithm. I give you a graph, you tell me if it's planar or not. Not easy at all, but it turns out you can do it in linear, in linear time if you try hard enough. Uh, testing, so for coloring a three colorable graph, that's NP hard already. So if I view your graph and I guarantee you it's three colorable, I just don't tell you what the coloring is, and I say, why don't you color it for me, and you can use four colors, not just three. That's an NP hard problem, surprisingly enough. But, uh, by, uh, can we know that the four coloring is guaranteed to exist? Can we still NP hard to color it? 
Yeah, to, to find the coloring, interestingly. Uh, now, you mentioned uh, other manifolds. So here's the first result. So on a torus, seven colors are necessary and sufficient. Uh, so here's an example of a torus where seven colors are necessary. So I'm representing the torus as a square where opposite sides are identified together. So if you take these two sides and make it a cylinder, then to take two opposite sides of the cylinder and close it up as a torus, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven colors are necessary because this will touch this, this green will touch this green, right? This red will touch so because it closes on itself, and obviously seven colors are sufficient here, and it turns out it's hard to prove that seven colors are, are also necessary. Uh, oh, excuse me, seven colors are necessary. And for any other configuration, it's also sufficient. So this example shows that seven colors are necessary. Why? Because every hexagon touches all the other six hexagons here. So you can think about it as a, as a, as a seven clique in terms of the graphs and wi which, which regions touch which other regions. It's seven cliques. So seven colors are necessary. Turns out they're also sufficient on the torus. Topologically, of course, a uh, torus is the same as a teacup. Right? And you can actually get cups. If you look hard enough on eBay, you'll get cups that are painted like a torus using seven colors with this kind of worst case examples. You know, if you if you're you know, makes a great uh, holiday gift if your loved ones appreciate uh, uh, topology and uh, graph coloring theorems. Um, now here's a more general result. So so the, the genus uh, or the genus of a, of, a, of a manifold is a number of holes in it. So a plane has genus 0, a torus has genus 1, you can have a double torus, it'll have genus 2 and so on. So the number of colors are both necessary and sufficient is known to be exactly a function of the genus that varies like this, basically as the square root of the genus. S more specifically, it's 7 plus 1 over plus 48 times the genus divided by 2. And here are some examples. So for the plane, four colors suffice. We already mentioned that. For the torus, seven colors suffice and are also necessary. For a double torus, it's eight. For a triple torus, it's nine. Quadruple torus, it's ten, and so on. It grows at the square root of the number of holes in the, in the manifold. And it's also different for other manifolds besides toruses. Right? You can have projective planes. You can have Mobius strips. Right? You can have other more complicated manifolds and um, you know besides those now uh, any questions about any of this so these are more like mathematical results just to kind of round out your you know for your information about coloring and manifolds and so where does coloring arises lots and lots of places entire books on graph coloring and for example if you do job scheduling and some jobs conflict with other jobs. Like job one conflicts with job two. You can't do, do both those jobs simultaneously because one depends on the other, or they both use the same resource as one another. So there's conflicts. So how do you schedule the jobs in order to avoid conflicts? Um, something called the minimum make span, and basically it's, it's equivalent to the chromatic number of the graph, the minimum number of nodes, uh, uh, the minimum number of colors necessary to paint, to color all the nodes appropriately. So for example, if you color this graph like this, where no two adjacent nodes share a color, you can schedule it across, say, three time spans. Time goes top to bottom. You can do job number four, because it doesn't conflict with anything else that you're doing at the same time. Then do five and two, because that doesn't conflict with each other. There's no edge between five and two. And then do job number uh, one and three down here in red during the third time period, and so on. And so this, uh, so the minimum graph color coloring number corresponds to the minimum time necessary to uh, execute a bunch of jobs, you know, you know, in a in a, the most highly parallel manner. Um, and uh, CPU register allocation in a compiler happens also using using graph coloring, right? So so variables that can be used simultaneously share an edge there. It's a conflict edge because they depend on each other and they cannot be assigned simultaneously because there's some dependency. So the graph coloring basically allows you to assign nodes to registers in a way that uh, doesn't create conflicts between accessing the different registers. Right, so if you assign these two red nodes to the first register and these two green nodes to the second register, you, you, know, you should be good. So it's a register allocation kind of solution inside a compiler, again, using graph coloring. There's Dozens and dozens of other applications of graph coloring to you know all over the place. 
Uh, any any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, so we're about to talk about approximation algorithms separately, but you can have all sorts of approximation algorithms for graph coloring and lots of these other entry complete problems, and we'll, we'll get into that next, actually. Uh, now, it turns out that some, some entry complete problems are highly approximable. You can approximate them to arbitrary degree of accuracy relative to optimal. Others are not. Uh, but anyway, just to remind us where we are in this roadmap, this touchstone for the course, you know, Chomsky hierarchy on steroids, uh, there's P and NP right here. They're above the context-free languages, but they're below polynomial space and even the general context-sensitive languages. Uh, and there's also all sorts of hierarchies all over the place, but the space-time hierarchy theorems, there's hierarchies all over the place, you know, but right now we're still in this region here, P and NP and the surrounding surrounding area. Um, so now we're going to start talking about heuristics. So when it comes to algorithms, execution speed and solution quality can come in different flavors. You can have algorithms that are slow and fast in general, and solutions that are exact or not exact, approximate. And ideally, you want a solution that's short and sweet. You want it to run fast, you want it to be exact, like sorting and binary search and things like that, Voronoi diagrams and convex holes. And it's nice when you can do that, minimum spanning trees, shortest path, Dijkstra, Prim. Uh, but sometimes uh, you can't do it uh, exactly fast, right? And so all you can hope for is exactly but slow, like uh, any one on entry complete problems. You can solve slowly, but you can solve it exactly if you're willing to take a lot of time. You'll get your answer slowly but surely. But in real life, y you can't wait that long. You can't wait for an exponential algorithm to finish before you deliver packages if you're a FedEx truck and so on. So you want some heuristics. You, know, you want something that's quick and dirty, runs fast, may not be the optimal, but if it's close enough to optimal, you're good. Okay? And some problems are so hard that even approximate solutions will be very slow. You'll get your answer too little too late, and that's the, the worst of all, both possible worlds. So ideally, you want to be in this quadrant if you can't be in the first quadrant. Okay? And so now we'll focus on this quadrant specifically and talk about heuristics, approximation algorithms. And ideally, we're going to prove that certain algorithms run quickly in time and not slowly. And not only that, the solution quality will be bounded by a certain fraction of optimal, like one and a half times optimal or two times optimal, no worse. And that's a nice guarantee to have. Okay. So the problem when you run heuristics is how to avoid getting trapped in local minima. So the solution space looks like this, kind of diagrammatically. There's a lot of you know, hills and meadows and, and, and valleys, but there's also very sharp crevasses that are narrow but very deep. And you're trying to find those, but they're narrow and deep, so it's easy to just step right over them. It's like a crack in the ground. How do you find those? And there could be trillions of them all over the place, exponential number of these. And how do you find the best? And it can be distributed in some weird way over the solution space. And I'm just showing you a 2D solution space depicted diagrammatically. But remember, solution spaces in general have many dimensions, could have thousands or even millions of dimensions. So if you try greedy descent methods that just, uh, you know, optimally or at least greedily try to descend down the valleys and find local minima, these local minima may not be the global minima, and often they're not. So you may get stuck in local minima if you tried greedy descent from different places, even if you tried from multiple places. And you may miss these long, deep crevasses, you know, holes that you're looking for, and you'll miss them altogether. Where this could be the, the global optimum, you'll never find it because there's only a few of them, and they're very, very narrow cracks in the solution space going down deep. But everywhere else is just local minima, and they'll form like sand traps for your golf balls. You, you, you will get stuck there. So how do you avoid those? It's, in general, it's, it's a trick. It's, 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 it's hard to do. It's not easy at all. Um, and some intractable problems can be efficiently approximated. Others can't. Um, you know, so uh, you can use heuristics, like greedy heuristics. And for some problems, they work really well, like Prim and Dijkstra you know, use greedy approach, and they work pretty good. Uh, ideally, you want a provably good approximation. Approximation is guaranteed not to be more than, say, twice optimal or you know, 50% more than optimal. Ideally, epsilon, arbitrary close to optimal for some fixed epsilon. 
Um, and then some slower approaches that have been used is some branch and bound approaches, e integer linear programming. Those typically tend to run an exponential time worst case. So, and then there's this wishful thinking, what I kind of refer to as wishful thinking algorithm, that you basically throw something at it and hope for the best. You know, so simulate annealing. How many of you have simulated annealing? Uh, you know, basically simulate you know, uh, the physics uh, kind of temperature quenching kind of crystallization process. We take some hot glass, molten glass, you know, let it cool, and eventually it will quench on some you know, minimal energy state of a crystal, crystal mean structure or whatever. But it's hard to quantify how well it will do, and it tends to take a long time anyway. And you can start at different places based on the temperature. You make long jumps. When the temperature cools, it's, it's all simulated. The temperature is not real, but it's simulated. When the temperature is high, you take long jumps, try to spread around the solution uh, landscape, and uh, try to find different you know, local minima. And then you do greedy descent with big jumps, and the temperature cools down. The s jumps become smaller and smaller. Anyway, it seems to work well for some problems. It simulates kind of the physical analog of heating and quenching and crystallization and so on. Other wishful thinking is genetic algorithms. You probably heard about those. Again, you try to simulate natural selection where solutions can combine with other solutions. And you have mother solution, father solution, giving rise to an offspring solution. But if it begins to sound a little hokey, it's because it is. Um, we're trying to kind of appeal to nature. Basically, the argument is a billion years of evolution can't be wrong, so do what nature does. Uh, well, these are not very well understood. The, the outcomes are not predictable. It's hard to quantify what you get. They even take a long time to run. And so don't get in the habit of throwing arbitrary solutions at problems just because you don't know how to do it well. Um, you know, it's like, it's like bashing together two Swiss watches to figure out how a Swiss watch works. Yeah, yeah, you know, parts will fly all over the place, and you'll see what's inside, but that's not the best way to figure out how a Swiss watch works. Uh, so that's sort of what, what you're doing here. You're bashing together our, our arbitrary, you know, mechanisms with new problems that you don't understand very well, and maybe it will work, maybe it won't, but it's, it's, a, it's not a good uh, uh, reflex to develop. Ideally, you want to understand what you're doing better, understand the structure of the problem, try to prove things. You could always... You can always throw this at the problem if nothing else works, but don't make it your first choice. Okay. Um, so, any questions about kind of the general scenario of algorithms, heuristics, why we resort to them once we know a problem is empty complete? It gives you license to use heuristics, but don't use heuristics before you know the problem is intractable. You know, because what if you use a heuristic for sorting? There's plenty of sorting heuristics you can come up with. Let me let me try one in real time. Um, you want to sort an array? Great. You know, pick, pick, pick a random pair, and if they're out of, so if out of order, swap them. Repeat. Do that n times. How many see this will start shoving the array towards a sorted order? Yeah, of course. Will this, is this guaranteed to sort? No, but it'll be pretty close to sort. It's a sorting heuristic. I just came up with it. You can come up with your own favorite ones. But this is kind of hokey because we know that sorting can be done exactly in n log n time. So why go through all this trouble just to do it in linear time if you're not even going to get the right answer? So it's an, it's, it's an example of this knack to use heuristics when you don't understand how to solve a problem. Uh, I can come up with heuristics for multiplication. It will be kind of imprecise multiplication. It will run faster than you know, same Same for other, other problems. But my point to you is don't do that as a first instinct or a first reflex. Step back, think about it, look at the problem, try to you know, understand the structure of it and so on. Because these heuristics, you can always try them as a last resort, but not as, you shouldn't do it as a first resort, is my point. OK, let me give you a few heuristics that are provably good, starting with some simple ones, and we'll go into more complicated ones, and uh, show you how, how, it, how it goes. So mi minimum vertex cover, we know it's empty complete. We, it's one of uh, you know Carp's original problems. Given a graph, find a minimum set of vertices that touch every edge. So, for example, here's a graph. I give it to you, and I ask you which set of vertices, which subset of the vertices do you want to pick, such that every edge in the graph will be incident touching one of your vertices. And of course, you want a minimum number of vertex cover, you know, the smallest number of vertices possible, not the greatest number, because the greatest number will be all every vertex in the graph, but that's too many. So for example, here, if you take this vertex and that vertex and that vertex, sure enough, every edge 
in the graph is adjacent to one of these three red vertices. So that's the heuristic solution. Of course, for this graph, here's an optimal solution where only two vertices are used, and you get the same effect. Every edge is incident to one of those two vertices in this better solution than this one. So that's the solution of size 3. That's the solution of size 2. 2 is better here. And there's no solution of size 1 for this example. You can't take a single node to accomplish the same effect. So that's an optimal solution. Lots of applications of this in bioinformatics and, you know, double E and all sorts of engineering fields. It's a very ubiquitous problem. So uh, it's also, one, of, as I mentioned, one of CARP's original MP complete problems in this paper that I showed you, one of his original 20 problems or so in his 1971 paper. All right, so here are some examples of minimum vertex covers for different graphs. You see it's not obvious. It's NP complete, and in general, it's hard to figure out, you know, what the minimum number of vertices necessary to touch every edge in the graph. Here are some more examples. Right? And if the graph gets bigger and more complicated, it's harder and harder to, to find these optimal solutions. But here's a heuristic that's guaranteed not to be m worse than twice optimal. So even though it's NP complete, and in fact it's NP complete even in planar graphs, and even in planar graphs of max degree 3, it's still NP complete. Okay, just like colorability. Um, so the minimum vertex cover could be solved exactly in exponential time. You know, uh, that's not, not a big trick. You just look at all possibilities, and you can do some shortcuts and some optimizations. But roughly in time n times 2 to the n, roughly, you can solve it by looking at all possibilities. There's also a non-approximability result. It turns out you can prove that this problem cannot be solved in polynomial time better than 1.36 times optimal unless p is equal to np, in which case you can solve it exactly in polynomial time. And, but we don't know if p is equal to np, and one is equivalent to the other. So unless p is equal to np, this is not approximable within a factor of 36% away from optimal. We know that much. And the real number could be much higher than that. That's just a lower bound on the approximability. Now, some NP-complete problems are approximable within arbitrarily close to optimal, like TSP, for example. Some are arbitrarily far away from optimal. There are problems that are so hard to approximate, NP-complete problems, are so hard to approximate, no constant bound will apply as a lower bound. The bound will be non-constant, like square root of n or even n times optimal. We know that for sure, too, for some problems. So approximability, all bets are off. Even though they're all NP-complete, not every NP-complete problem is as good, is as approximable as every other problem in terms of goodness of solution, constant time or some factor times optimal, not necessarily constant. Some are harder to approximate than others, provably so. So they're not all created equal with respect to approximability, even though they're all created equal with respect to exact polynomial time solutions. That's a different thing altogether. The two, one is not the same as the other. Okay, so the minimum matrix cover cannot, can be approximated no worse than twice optimal, and in fact, the approximation runs in linear time. So here's a hardness result from below, can't be approximated better than 1.36 times optimal, unless p is equal to np. Here we're saying it can be approximated no worse than twice optimal, and I'm about to give you the algorithm and prove it for this result here, twice optimal. The algorithm is so simple, it's one line. Pick an edge, any edge you want, arbitrarily. Add its two endpoints to the vertex cover that's growing, the, the, the approximate solution. Remove that edge from the graph and repeat. That's it. That's the entire algorithm that gives you a solution no worse than twice optimal for this NP-complete problem. So this, this was known for a long time, 1974. So now it's been, what, 45 years or so. And it's linear time, and it gives you a solution no worse than twice optimal. We're about, we're about to prove it. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so why is this such a good heuristic? And by the way, up to this date, nobody has a better solution than that, general solution than that, that's better than twice optimal guaranteed. So even though this is 45-year-old algorithm, that's the best we got so far. Interesting. You'd think that somebody would have proved that 1.9 times optimal, 1.7 times optimal. And, you know, of course, we know from below it's not going to be better than 1.36 times optimal, but that's okay. So again, pick a random edge, add both ends to the solution, eliminate those two 
nodes and their adjacent edges from the graph and then repeat for the rest of the graph. At the end, you will get a vertex cover because as long as there's edges in the graph, you're going to pick both of the endpoints and that edge will be touched. And you keep growing the solution. Eventually, all the edges in the graph will be touched by nodes in your solution. How many see correctness so far? OK, any questions about why this is correct? It'll give you a solution. It'll give you a node cover. Now, we're about to prove that the node cover will be no worse than twice the best possible node cover, even though the best possible node cover is, is an NP-complete problem, and we don't know how to solve it in polynomial time. This simple heuristic does the job no worse than twice the optimal every single time. And the idea is not very complicated. To cover this red edge here, at least this node or that node or both must be in a node cover solution, in any node cover solution that's optimal. How many get that? Because if neither x nor y are in the node cover, this edge ain't going to be touched. And so it can't be a node cover at all, much less an optimal node cover. So one of the x and the y must be in the solution, in the optimal solution. And we're throwing both into the solution. And one of them must be there. So the solution at this point cannot be twice what it must be as it keeps growing for the edges that it's covering so far. How many get that? Yeah. And as you keep doing this, that property is maintained, it's preserved. The growing solution will never be twice as long as it has to be to touch all the edges that are being touched so far by all the nodes in the currently growing solution. And at the end, all the edges are touched. And that property is preserved. And that resulting solution will never be twice, more than twice what it has to be. Because at least one of these two nodes that we're throwing in at every phase must already be there. And we're never throwing in more than twice what is necessary. And that's, that ratio is preserved, that twice the optimal at most is preserved at every phase. That's it. That's, that's the reasoning. So the solution, this yield, no worse than twice the optimal for this NP-complete problem. So that's an example of our first provably good heuristic solution to an NP-complete problem, guaranteed to be no worse than twice the optimal. Now, let me ask you a few questions. Uh, will this give you always a solution that's equal to twice the optimal or close to twice the optimal? How many say, yeah? How many say, no, it usually won't be anywhere near twice as bad as the, yeah, exactly. Twice is the worst that can happen. That's the guarantee. It doesn't mean that on average it'll be anywhere close to twice. In fact, on average, if you run this on lots and lots of random graphs and tabulate statistics on millions or trillions of graphs, repeatedly run a lot of statistics, plot it, and compute the optimal, compare it to the optimal, on average, you'll only be a few percent worse than the, apple, than, than, than the optimal, not 100% not more, i.e. twice. That's typical of heuristics. But it's nice to have a guarantee, because some heuristics don't come with a guarantee. It could be arbitrarily far away from optimal, not just twice. And that can really hurt in real life. If you're, if you're AT&T and you're trying to come up with some big Steiner tree that's fiber optic across the uh, landscape of the United States to connect the 50 capitals of the United States, all the capital of all the states, uh, you definitely want to guarantee like that because then you can be assured that you're not spending more than twice what you had to if you had all the time in the universe to compute the best solution. What you don't want is just come up with some arbitrary heuristic that gives you some solution, and you may be spending 10 times or 100 times what you have to. That's not a warm, fuzzy feeling that you're you know, being thrifty with your resources and saving money or effort or time or whatever. Uh, any questions about this heuristic? Um, now, uh, there's easy ways to modify this heuristic to get you even better solutions on average. Give me some examples of how you'd modify these basic heuristics to get you better solutions, i.e., an average closer to optimal. There's lots of ways to do it. Name five. See if you really understand this, what's going on. Well, take some wild guesses. OK, so he's saying only add one of the two. So, so for this edge, just add this or this. Now, it's a nice try, but if you do that, you're going to lose this bound. In practice, doesn't mean the answer will be worse. But the guarantee, this theoretical guarantee, 
will be lost. But why? Because if you add this, it may be the wrong one to add. And you'll be adding some highly non-optimal one instead that really doesn't belong in, 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 the, in, a, in a final answer. Let me give you an example of that. Because I'm very good at coming up with counterexamples. And the reason I'm pretty good at it is because I spent years as a graduate student doing exactly that along with everything else. So, you know, give you you know, an example that looks like this. So for every edge, I'll pick one. So I'll pick this one. For this edge, I'll pick this one. For this edge, I'll pick this one. See what's going on? The optimal is what? Size one, just that one. But that will never be picked. And so how far away from optimal is that solution? In this case, potentially, worst case. If I have, if I have n nodes around, is it twice the optimal, 10 times the optimal? n times the optimal, n could be arbitrarily large. So it's not even a guaranteed to be a thousand times worse than the optimal. It, it'll be worse than that. So you see, the, the bound is not just lost, it's hopelessly lost. Right? But, but, but it's a good try. You know, that's a nice thing to try. Try again. Pick the, pick the node with the highest degree. Ah, that's a little better. So if you pick the node with the highest degree, you take an edge, you'll pick that one, not this one. Because you're trying to cover as many edges as possible, so you want to go for the high degree nodes to eliminate them first. How many understand that? That will work much better. Right? So this will, it's a, this, this will foil this example. But there are other examples that will foil that too, actually. I, we won't go there right now. Uh, but in practice, if you do this, it may actually produce better solutions than this. Now give me a heuristic that produces, for sure, solutions that are not worse than this and possibly a lot better. Yeah. Pick an edge where the sum of the two degrees, the sum of this degree and this degree, is maximum over all possible edges. And eliminate that first. So you're getting rid of as many edges as you can at every step. So you might be finished sooner and add less nodes. That, that's a good one. What else can you do? Yeah, and then, the, and then what? They both end in linear time. Yes. And uh, I will have a chance that uh, the other algorithm get better. Results. Yeah. So do what you did over here with the highest degree node one at a time separately independently of that, run this heuristic. And then out of those two, do what? Take the best one. So now you inherit this bound automatically. And maybe you'll do better on average. You certainly won't do any worse. And chances are you'll do a lot better on average. That's good. So if you want to not lose a bound, you don't have to go out too much out of your way. Run the thing that has the bound. Run whatever crazy scheme you want on the side. And take the best of the two, and you get the best of both worlds. Because that solution inherits the bound. This one may or may not be better. But if it is better, that will reduce the average. If it's worse, ignore it. And just stick with that one. So you won't be worse off, and you might be better off. And chances are you will be better off. Uh, it's, a, it's a hedging strategy. Right? It's like the venture capital model of computation. Right? Venture, again, venture capitalists invest in several companies. They don't know which will become Google or Facebook or Amazon. Some will be duds. and will, you know, Nine out of ten companies die in the first couple of years, and that's it. That's how Silicon Valley works. That's how business works. But they don't know which, so they invest in several, and one of them pans out and pays for all the others and then some. So you know you can inherit the success of one company, and the failures don't matter. Okay, so you can do that algorithmically all the time. So keep that in mind as you construct algorithms in your career. You don't have to abandon a good bound if you don't want to, and you can still try to win on the side some other way. And all you're doing is maybe doubling or tripling your your, your runtime, 
you know, and, uh, and even if this takes a while to run, longer than this, on average, it may be worth it. You should run some tests and statistics and tabulate data and see if it's worth it, what the increase is in solution quality given you're investing more time running things on the side. That works pretty good on average. OK, any other thoughts or questions? So this is a general technique, what we just said. It works in, in arbitrary scenarios. And again, I mentioned that to this day, we don't know anything better than this in terms of absolute bound. But if you run a bunch of heuristics like this simultaneously, as a meta heuristic, I, uh, I call them meta heuristics. I coined that term in, in, in a very early 90s. Um, if you run this meta, meta heuristics, chances are you'll do a lot better than any one heuristic. Let me ask you this question. This is a subtle question. When you run a, two, a meta heuristic that combines two heuristics, like say these two ones that are on the board, one on the board, one on the slide, the, com the combined meta heuristic can be much better than either one. So if one heuristic gives you, say, solutions that are, say, on average, no more than 10% more than the optimal, another heuristic gives you uh, solutions that are no, no worse than, say, 15% worse than the average. The combined meta heuristic, you would think that the average performance would be between 10 and 15% worse, right? That's intuitively what you would guess. But the combined heuristic, meta heuristic, on the 10% and 15% heuristics could be no more than 0.0001%, almost optimal. H how can that be true? How can two mediocre heuristics be combined in a meta heuristic to give you an almost perfect heuristic? That's excellent, much more excellent than either one separately. How, how, how would you explain that? That can happen. How, how many can see that that can happen? How many can see why this can happen? How many can explain why this can happen? All right, I see less and less hands. Explain to me why, why this can happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's this complementation. Both functions trade each other off e expertise of each other. You know, so 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 one function could could you know one function could be uh, very good, can be and this is this is you know this is decreasing cost or solution quality. One function could be very very good here, but bad over here. The other function could be very, very good here, but just, just bad over there. And if you co combine the two, you'll always be down here in the weeds. And, he, and, and, and anyone by itself, half the time will be terrible. Together, they'll always be great because they have complementary skills in some sense. In real life, it's the same situation. You know, let, let's say you have a, a, you know, a pair of people, one is good at science and one is good at art. You take just the scientists and they'll suck at have half the things in life that have to do with art or emotions or feelings or fuzzy kind of thinking. You know, the, the artists will be great at aesthetics and at uh, you know, artful things, but will suck at science and, and precision you know, about algorithms and programming. And, but if you take their combination, have them work as a team, they have complementary skills, and together, They'll beat any task down and do it excellently as a team. If the ta task is artistic, the, s the, art the their artists will kind of take over and guide the scientists. If the, if the task is scientific, the other way around. And as a team, they'll be unbeatable. That's exactly what goes on here algorithmically, or can go on algorithmically, if you apply the strategy the, the right way. Any questions about that? So. A combination of a pair of algorithms could be much, much, very highly dramatically better than either one separately, not just a little bit, arbitrarily better, just like a team of two specialists. You know, that's why you know, when, when you send like a special forces team, right, you don't just send you know, a bunch of snipers. You send a sniper together with an explosive expert, with ex together with a hand-to-hand -hand combat specialist, together with a navigator, together with a spotter, you know, and, and together as a team, you know, it's like in the, in the movies, right? The Expendables or whatever, you know, there's all these specialists. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. But, you know, th it's exactly the point. You know, people trade off expertise with each other. And together they make unbeatable team. But if they were all explosive experts, you know, too bad if they have to snipe or, you know, navigate, right? 
um, they'll be lost. Okay, any other questions about any of these general algorithmic precepts or heuristic? Meta-heuristics, really, is what, what these are. Uh, okay, another problem. Uh, maximum cut. Um, given a graph, find a partition of the vertices that maximizes the number of edges going across. So for example, here's the input graph, and I can find some partition, but now two edges cross the partition. I want to increase that size to the maximum possible. So what you can do is you can take this node and put it across. Now you'll have three edges across. Or you can create some sort of solution like this. The cut size now is four, and you want to maximize it. The optimal will be this cut size, five. And it's not going to be bigger than five, because there's only five edges in the graph. So it's not going to be more edges across the cut than there are edges in the graph. Uh, but the question is, what's the maximum cut size you can achieve by partitioning the nodes into two subsets? Uh, it turns out it's intractable. You know, it's not to be complete, uh, but it has lots of applications in VLSI and physics and you know, network design and so on. And that's also one of CARP's original 20 or so problems that we saw in his famous paper. Yeah. Well, so it, l let me say more about, so, so he's asking a very good question. He's asking, is there a way to transform a problem to another problem, an NP-complete problem to another NP-complete problem that preserves approximability? Because the way we transform them according to the A to B with this F and so on, it just preserves yeses to yeses and noes to noes. It preserves solutions to solutions and non-solutions to non-solutions. It just preserves membership, set membership. Uh, it doesn't preserve approximation. So it doesn't preserve, you know, you, you can't take an instance here with a solution that's really good, and across the transformation, the solution to the other transformed instance will also necessarily be pretty good as well. It could be terrible in terms of approximation value. So they can both be yeses, but one will be a good yes, the other will be a terrible yes in terms of total value, value here versus value there. So it preserves yeses to yeses and noes to noes. What it doesn't do, these transformations, are preserving almosts to almosts or, or near optimals to near optimals. It doesn't do that. It's because these transformations are just conserved to preserving membership blindly. They don't, they're not concerned with the approximate value of solutions, just whether a solution exists or doesn't exist, not how good it is. If they were randomized, then would, would, would that be so, so let me let me also say that there's a class of transformation are called approximability preserving transformations that, that do do that. But they're not the ones we've seen. And they're one, not the ones we talked about. And they're very complicated because you have this extra onus now to preserve approximability across the transformation, not just the membership yeses to yeses and nose to nose near misses will be transformed to near misses here. So almost, we become almost. And bads will remain bads, and goods will remain goods on the other side. The normal transformations don't do that. But there's a class of transformations that do that too. They're just more complicated, harder to come by, harder to prove that they actually do this. It's a whole field of study. But people have, have thought about that. Um, in general, th and in general, it's very hard to do. And for some problems, it's probably impossible to do, simply because some problems are not approximable at all. There are NP-complete problems, and you can prove, provably so, that n there's no constant time bound approximation bound whatsoever. It doesn't exist in polynomial time, unless p is equal to NP, in which case it does exist, but that, you know, only because p is equal to NP. Then you can solve it exactly in polynomial time. So there are problems which are not approximable, but they're all transformable to one another, like Cook's theorem. So for sure, by definition, some problems cannot be transformed to another NP problem in a way that preserves the approximability, simply because the one it's transforming to doesn't have an approximability bound, never mind one that you can actually point to and prove something about. It just doesn't exist, provably so. We know that for sure. So, so so, so even when you can do that, there's many cases where you literally cannot do that, not because it's hard, because these things don't exist. So that's a more general you know, answer to your question. 
Okay, so we're about to come up with a heuristic for this one that, again, is pretty good. So the minimum vertex cover is NP-complete. We know that from CARP. Uh, and the maximum cut problem can be solved in polynomial time to using plane, uh, for planar graphs. In fact, the maximum cut problem, the, the maximum cut will be at least, will be uh, roughly the square root of the number of nodes. It's always a cut, no worse than that. Now, you also know a non-approximability result that this maximum cut problem cannot be approximated better than 17 over 16 times optimal, unless p is equal to np. That's the analog of this previous thing for vertex cover that was 1.36 or whatever, lower bound. Here, here the bound is um, a little, a little uh, uh, looser, 17 over 16. Now, it turns out it can be approximated in polynomial time within a bound of no worse than twice. And that algorithm is pretty simple, and the proof is not that hard. We're about to prove that. Okay, so there's your. Um, uh, it can be approximated in polynomial time also within 1.14. That's a separate. So we're going to show this this easier result, two times optimal. But I'm telling you that this is a better result. It can be approximated within time, within uh, within uh, polynomial time within 1.14 times optimal. That's roughly, what, one-seventh or so, uh, which is better. So, so, so the upper bound here kind of is pretty close to the lower bound, much more so than in the previous problem, where the upper bound and the lower bound were separated by, you know, from 1.36 to 2. That's a pretty big gap. Here the, b the gap is much smaller. So it's already we're seeing differences in approximability, you know, between these two problems. And by the way, this is 1.06, right? So... So we can achieve 1.14. We cannot achieve better than 1.06. And I'm going to show you two times optimal because that's easy to do. This one is much harder to do. And this pr negative proofs like this, negative results showing that you're not a millionaire, those are really complicated usually, you know, requiring many, many pages or dozens of pages of argument. Here's the two times optimal algorithm. Start with an arbitrary node across the, you know, uh, arbitrary partition across the nodes. So just draw a random line through, through a random cut through the nodes, and then see if moving a single node across the cut will improve the cut size. And if so, move that node across the cut, and then repeat this process, and that's it. So here's an example of execution. Start with a random cut, and then ask yourself, can you take a node and move it across the cut to increase the cut size? In this case, you can move the E over here, for example. So you do that. You move the E across the cut, so the cut size you know, increase from 2 to 3, right? And then if you can't do any better, stop. So now there's not a, not a way to, to move a single node across the cut in a way that increases the cut size anymore. If you put the C here, nothing will change. Put the D here, cut size won't change. Put the B here, the cut size will disimprove, not improve. Um, and, and so that's the solution, cut size 3. Of course, we already know that the optimal is size 5. So this is nowhere near the optimal, but it's no worse than twice the optimal, right? In other words, we get 3, and this is 5, and 5 is not as good as, you know, uh, uh, so, so, so this is not as bad as 2 times 3, which is 6, right? So it's, it's at least half the optimal. Half the optimal would be 2 and a half, and this is at least 3. So this is no worse than twice the optimal. Now, why is this heuristic so good that it's no worse than twice the optimal? So the, the, the idea is to notice that the final cut that you end up with, if you keep applying this rule, must contain at least half of all the edges. Why? Because if you have a node that has more neighbors on its own side, like this one has one neighbor on its own side, on the right side, but no neighbors on the left side, less neighbors on the left side, in this case zero, moving it across will increase the cut size. How many get that? Because all of its neighbors will become non-neighbors, and all, you know, all of its neighbors on its side will, become, will contribute to the cut, and all the um, nodes on the other side will subtract from the cut, and so the difference between the two will be the net gain in the size of the cut once you move that node across. So basically, at least when everything is finished and the algorithm ends, for every node, at least half of its neighbors will be on the other side of the cut. How many see that? Okay, Because if it isn't, move, move it across the cut, and you'll gain, like this rule says in the heuristic. 
So for when you finish, everything is done, at least half the nodes that are neighbors of any node will be on the opposite side of the cut, not on the same side of the cut as where the node is, which means at least half the edges in the graph will cross the cut. And the cut will never be bigger than the number of edges in the graph to begin with, and at least half of them cross the cut, which means the solution you get out of this heuristic is at least half as good as the optimal best possible solution. How many understand that logic? OK. And that's where your two times optimal bound comes from. We just proved it. And look how simple the heuristic is. You know, it just runs very quickly. It's easy to determine the, you know, these, these nodes that will improve the cut. And very quickly, it'll converge on some, on some result. And this is guaranteed to be no worse than twice. Now, first of all, let's do the same kind of an uh, improvement analysis we did before. How can you improve this heuristic to do even better than in practice? Yeah, so one way is to look at pairs of nodes and move them simultaneously. So if you take a pair and move them simultaneously, sometimes you're able to do things that you couldn't do by moving one across and not two across. But now there's more choices and more things to look at, and it'll run slower, but you'll get better solutions. What's another practical kind of enhancement that may get you better solutions in practice? Maybe somebody else. Get other people talking getting involved. Feel the rush, it's good. It's the adrenaline rush of speaking up, and maybe you'll be wrong, but maybe you'll be right. But either way, you get points for being courageous and speaking up. That's always good. Doesn't matter if you, you know, it's not correct. It's speaking up is a good thing. So what do you think? What other enhancements can you think of to this basic heuristic? Yeah, P pick the node, for example, that improves the cut size by the largest amount. So, you know, take the, 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 the node with the highest difference between nodes on the other side and nodes on its side. And the one with the highest difference, as you move it, will get you the highest increase in the cut size. How many get that? So you can do so. And then you, you'll win more sooner, and maybe you'll win more overall. Maybe you won't, actually. This is not guaranteed to give you a better solution, but if it does, Forget the original solution and use that one instead. So it's a meta heuristic. So you run this one. By the way, does this new heuristic of picking the node with the highest difference in you know neighbors on one side versus the other is that inheriting? Will that get, guarantee you this two times optimal bound? Uh, you can run this simultaneously. What if you just run it? My question is, if you just run that, not never mind the original. Just pick a node that maximizes the difference between neighbors on its side minus neighbors on the other side and do that flip. You still get a two times optimal bound, is my question. Yeah, y yeah you do. Why? Because you're still putting at least half of the. Uh, yeah, because it's a variation of this. Here we said arbitrary node. And now you're taking a specific node, not an arbitrary node. A specific node is a special case of an arbitrary node. And this works for any node that you choose. And if you choose that one, that will work too because that is a special case of arbitrary. That's subsumed by the arbitrary rule. And and the, the, the two times optimal bounds inherited and possibly can get better results in practice. So here you don't even have to do a meta heuristic and run both to inherit the rule. You can s simply run modifications on which node you choose. Now if you choose a pair of nodes and flip those, do you inherit that bound? Not, not necessarily. Uh, you'll have to think about it and see if that still works. Um, you may inherit the bound. What do you guys think? Let's think a little more deeply. You should pick a pair of nodes and swap them. Should we start with the metrics and, uh, and only s uh, swap pairs of nodes when the, you can maximize the difference between the two sides? Yeah. And, and, and will that inherit the two times optimal bound? Yeah. So how about this? You apply either rule. You either swap a pair or you swap a single or put, put a single node across, whichever you prefer. 
and you just keep repeating that until you can't do any more of those. Will that inherit the two times optimal bound? How many say yes? Yeah, now you're getting it. Why? Because when, when you stop doing this, because, and why will you stop doing this? Because you can't do any more of these moves that will keep improving. But when you stop doing this, no node moving across will improve, which means it has more neighbors across than on its own side, which means the same argument will hold as before, that you've reached at least half the edges in the graph will cross the cut, and you know worse than twice, or you are inheriting the bound. You see, you can analyze different heuristics now. Um, and also, you know, there's other ways to win, right? It's an arbitrary node right here. So often you'll have ties, for example. And if you break ties differently, you may end up with different solutions, different, si different cost solutions. How many can see that? Because you might get stuck at different other places than you would have get stuck, not gotten stuck before or get stuck earlier or later. So run this heuristic several times, breaking ties arbitrarily. Take the best of the k answers of running it k times. And the bound is inherited. How many see that? But the best of k, on average, will be better than just one. Certainly, it won't be worse, and often better. In fact, sometimes you'll get optimal solutions out, out, of, out of one of the k ways of arbitrarily choosing this node. It doesn't even have to be tie-breaking. You can take a, you know, a node that doesn't improve as much and do that first in one of your runs. And, you know, Take a random node, and as long as it saves, push it across. Take, take, do it k times. So, so you're only paying a factor of k times the original cost in time. But the solution quality will improve quite dramatically in practice if you run it on arbitrary you know, random graphs and so on. And you can uh, go on and on. You see how easy it is to come up with heuristics. And it's often not that hard to preserve the bound. Worst comes to worst, do the meta heuristic of run the original put that aside, and then do all the heuristics in the world that you want, however convoluted. Just make sure that if you know, none of them are better than the original, you use the original that has the bound. And now you've heard that the bound yet again. So, it's, so you don't have to jettison the bound to do a hell lot of experimentation and getting bit better in practice. And in practice, this works really, really well for all sorts of hard problems. This, this, this simple Jedi trick will, will get you a long way in your future job as a computer scientist. Just don't forget this trick. My gift to you. Just, all you have to do is give me 10% of your salary and I'll be happy. Uh, it's a joke. Uh, what, what else? Yeah. Um, wouldn't the order in which you apply this heuristic affect the uh, change of things you make in the future? Sure. And, and you can get into like uh, ordering issues. Yes. You can get into all sorts of dead ends. Yeah. Or not, based on which you did first, which you didn't do first. Is, that, is, is there a general way to determine like... Um, no, there isn't. Because uh, if there was a way to avoid dead ends, you will often find the optimal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you can find the optimal all that often, or, or certainly if you can find the optimal always, P will be equal to NP. So if it was a general way to avoid dead ends, you, maybe you could exploit that into proving that P is equal to NP by solving that complete problem optimally. Yeah. Uh, but, but even if you don't, in general, avoid dead ends, just a lot of the time, even that's very hard. By avoiding dead ends, what we really mean, what we really mean is avoiding these guys. These are the dead ends. This is the optimal. That's hard to find because it could be in a very narrow crevasse that it's easy to just step over because it's microscopic in width, but infinite in depth, and very hard to find. So how many how many get this? So so he's talking about exactly this picture again. How do you avoid these dead ends and find these good solutions? In general, we have no idea how to do that, in general. But we have lots and lots of heuristics that get you a long way towards that. And that's what we've been talking about all along here, is provably good heuristics that have a good absolute bound, plus all sorts of practical ways of enhancing them even more and getting better and better solutions. Um, so that's... That's kind of how heuristics go. Any other questions? And heuristics are not hard to come by. What's hard is proving good bounds about the heuristics. And, but if you don't want to prove bounds, you could still practically run them, test them on millions of cases, and then vet them, 
and if they seem to be to, to operate you know very well in practice in practice it's even it's almost as good or even better sometimes than just proving a bound and not, not knowing anything else so for example my one Stein heuristic uh, that I develop as a graduate student basically find you know one Steiner point just one that will minimize the total minimum spanning tree cost over the original points plus the new Steiner point that you find and that will reduce the MST cost, minimum Spanish equal, by the largest possible amount, that's actually easy to solve one Steiner point in, in quadratic time. It's called the one Steiner problem. But then repeat that for the next point and the next point and the next point. So it's called the one the iterated one Steiner heuristic. Came up with it you know, you know, a lo long time ago, longer than probably most of you have been alive. But the point is this heuristic has no worse than one and a half times optimal behavior. 50% worse than the optimal. But in practice, it's no worse than half a percent, half of 1%, not 50%, not 30%, not 20%, not 5%, half a percent, on average for random points that's uniformly distributed in the unit square. Um, and well, half a percent is really good. 50% um, is not so good, but it almost never does as bad as 50 In fact, it's hard to find counterexamples where it actually approaches 50%, although I, I did that too. There's, there's worst case examples where this is arbitrarily close to 50% in arbitrary dimensions. Not just two dimensions, but three dimensions and arbitrary dimensions. So heuristics are not hard to come by. Proving bounds on them is hard. And you know, chances are uh, they work pretty well in practice if you try a lot of things and you do a meta heuristic and you know it's just make sure that all the components run run fast. That you're not paying a lot of time and space for running lots and lots of heuristics and or heuristics multiple times with different random choices along the way. Why? Because if you spend a ho whole lot of time, you might as well solve it exactly, brute force, or 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 close to it. You know. So, um, and and next time we'll show how to solve traveling salesman problem no worse than twice the optimal. And if we have time, we'll do it one and a half times optimal. Uh, it's not it's not that hard. The the proof is basically here. Although, you know, we should probably you know stop now. So we'll we'll keep going on heuristics, provably good heuristics. Uh, you'll get the hang of how to construct good heuristics with good provable bounds, and uh, then then we'll talk about other stuff. Any any thoughts or questions? I think we have two more meetings right besides today, two more classes before you know. Is that am I right? Next week and then the week after that will be the last day of class, May first. So uh, you know, we'll try to cover as much as we can the next two two classes. Question. Um, well, uh, PTAS, uh, not so much. We'll mention a few, but but we we won't have time to get into the nitty gritty. But for extra credit, heck, you know, just look it up, and you know, it's uh, it's it's good stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, but I I don't think we'll have time to do to do much of that in class. So by PTAS, you know, pr polynomial approximation schemes, he means polynomial time approximation schemes. There's, there's heuristics. Uh, in fact, even for TSP, there's heuristics. Here's one by Aurora uh, for geometric TSP. You can get arbitrarily close to optimal. You get 1 plus epsilon times optimal for any epsilon that you get to choose. But the catch is that if you choose epsilon very small, like 0.1 or 0.01, It'll run in polynomial time, all right, but the polynomial will be degree inversely proportional in epsilon. Degree will be 1 over epsilon, roughly. So if you choose epsilon 0.1, yeah, this will get you no more than 10% more than optimal, worst case, but it'll run in time n to the 10th. If you want epsilon 0.01, you'll get no worse than 1% more than the optimal, guaranteed, but it'll run in time n to the 1 over 1%, which is n to the 100. So that's sort of, it's in, you know, there's no free lunch, basically. You 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 pay what you know. You get what you pay for. You know, you get quality of solution in what you pay for in CPU time, or runtime, basically. Uh, but for extra credit, look this look up this result. It's now 20 years old, and it's it's pretty good. Now this only works for geometric TSP, where the triangle inequality holds. Um, you know, but general graph traveling salesman. That's one of those that cannot be approximated with any constant times optimal bound. We can prove that. So general graph TSP is not approximable. It not only doesn't have a p-test, a polynomial time approximation scheme like this, 
It doesn't have any approximation scheme whatsoever, unless p is equal to np, in which case it has a perfect approximation scheme of solving it optimally because p is equal to np in polynomial time. Um, so, so with respect to approximability, some problems are much harder than others. You know, in terms of approximability, some are easily approximable, but we already saw examples no worse than twice optimal. Some are not approximable within any constant, no matter how high. So TSP in general graphs is not approximable even within a million times optimal, not possible unless p is equal to np. And others are somewhere in between. Some approximable within log factor, not necessarily constant factor. Um, and uh, we'll also talk about graphic isomorphism and uh, zero knowledge proofs. Uh, that's always always cool, you know. So zero knowledge proofs are basically ways to approximate um, um, proofs. So you can prove to somebody that you know the proof without giving them a proof, and provably not giving them any information about why it's true. You just arbitrarily convince them that it is true. You know, with, with higher and higher probability, with vanishing probability that you're lying when you say, I have a proof. So it's a very interesting, we didn't even know such a thing was possible before, you know, the late 80s or early 90s, you know, uh, whenever this was invented, late 80s, I guess. So this is an approximation scheme for proofs. You're approximating a proof in some sense. And we'll talk more about that next time. That's, that's pretty cool. And it has a lot of applications, I think, in crypto, in security, a friend of foe identification systems, military scenarios. You want to convince somebody of something, but you don't want to let out the actual argument or proof why it's true. Just convince them arbitrarily, close, arbitrarily, confidently that it is true without actually telling them why or how. Um, it's, it's almost, these two conditions are almost at odds with each other. If I want to convince you of something, I need to tell you what it is. Otherwise, how would you know if I'm right? Turns out I don't need to tell you, and I can convince you arbitrarily strongly that something is true. It's kind of interesting. It's used a lot now in finance, and um, in fact, Bitcoin is sort of one of those, right? H how many get that? I mean, with Bitcoin, you're proving all sorts of things about ownership and transactions and how much Bitcoin you have without disclosing anything, ideally, to, to anybody else. It's not quite zero knowledge proof, but it, it, it's the same idea. You know, you. You, you you preserve you you prove that you own the coins and that you're spending the coins and you know you, you're entitled to 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 use the coins because they're yours and so on but you're not disclosing anything including your own identity which is kind of interesting uh, it's even possible uh, question. Yeah, so, so you get arbitrarily close, you know, in, in, ter in, in other words, the, the chances that you're lying is vanishingly small. It's exponentially decaying with the number of iterations that you go through. It's never zero yeah. because, you know, to be completely, absolutely beyond doubt, sure, you have to see the whole thing. Just like in Bitcoin. You know, in Bitcoin, it's, it's possible to cheat if you had, you know, infinite amount of CPU time. Just like in crypto systems, if you have infinite amount of, cr you know, you can try all possible keys, and one of them will decipher the message. But there's an exponential number of keys, and nobody has that kind of computation power. So, you know, crypto systems work with arbitrarily high confidence, but never absolutely with, you know, with infinite assurance, with absolute assurance. Um, and the same thing, the same thing here. But think, th th think about that, you know. Eh, you know, if, if, if you walk out into the street in a, in, during when it rains, there's, there's, a, there's a, some chance you'll be hit by lightning and die in any given moment. Seriously. I mean, I'm not, not making it up. You know. But the chance is so small that you usually don't even worry about it. Right? A meteorite can hit you at any moment when you're, you know, even, in, even when you're inside a building and go through all the floors. And, you know, a meteorite is, is like, you know, flies the speed of a bullet, right? And it's big. So, you know, concrete's not going to stop it. It's armor-piercing. But, but, but the chance is so small that you don't really worry about it. So for practical purposes, it's good enough. You know, if the chance is one in a billion or one in a trillion, that's pr plenty good for, for practice, you know, for, for practical scenarios. Uh, you know, there's, there's always a chance somebody will guess your banking password and steal all your cash out of your checking account. That can happen. But it's a small probability. So you don't constantly worry about it. I hope you don't constantly worry about it because there will be a lot of worrying all the time. You know? so, so we already 
put our faith and trust and even money, you know, betting them on these principles of probabilities in every aspect of our, of our life. You know, so, so it's not a far-fetched you know, scenario. Um, we're already doing that all the time. You know, so, you know, uh, my, my, my car, the Tesla, you know, uh, people hear that, you know, it says, oh, you know, but it's all computer controlled and somebody can break into your car and steal it by hacking the operating system of the Tesla and, or guessing your password, you know, sure. But if they were so good at guessing passwords, why would they steal my car? They should just go after all your bank accounts and get all your cash, you know, and then buy as many cars as they want with, I mean, with, with, with the money. I mean, you see, but they're not worried about that. But that's the first thing I hear. You know. I mean, anyways, it's not very rational thinking. Uh, we're taking chances every which way we turn every day of our lives. Every time you cross the street, you're taking a big chance. Probably much higher chance than somebody breaking in, you know, into your bank account by guessing the password, actually, if you, if you, look, if you look at the numbers. Okay, what else? Anything else? Uh, yeah. Well, the, the interact, well, first of all, you haven't discussed the details, but we will next time. The interaction has to be efficient. Mm -hmm. It has to be polynomial time and hopefully very low order polynomial, like linear or even less than that. It has to be efficient. Um, and the, the, chance, the chances of breaking this or, or, you know, a false negative or a false positive have to be, you know, exponentially small. And then it's good enough for practical purposes. It turns out that you can have zero knowledge proofs for everything in, in P space. So I guess I'll, I'll jump ahead even more. Uh, not only everything in NP has a zero knowledge proof scenario, but everything in P space does too. Um, so I'm jumping ahead quite a bit, but uh, let me just uh, say that uh, um, in, the, uh, in 1992, Adi Shamir proved that inter in interactive proofs is equivalent to P space. Everything in P space has an interactive proof and vice versa. Everything interactive proof has a polynomial time algorithm in P space to compute it and so on. That was a major result, actually. Uh, Adi Shamir is the S in RSA, in case you didn't know. He's a Turing Award winner. Um, a couple of years ago, he was denied visa to the United States uh, because uh, you know he wanted to give an invited talk at some major conference where he invited a talk, he was denied visa. Sadly enough, a Turing, Award, Turing Awards winner, tu Turing Award winners get get and Nobel Prize winners get denied visas sometimes. So if you have if you have issues with immigration, you know, you know that that's uh, that <laughs> that's pretty bad when when Turing Award winners and Nobel Prize winners uh, are not allowed to come in and give a talk and leave. You know, uh, strangely enough. But these are the times we live in, and I again digress. Uh, any other questions? Um, Alrighty then, so we'll see you next time, and uh, please read the book on these subjects, NP completeness and transformations, approximation algorithms, it, you know, look them up, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, the fifth homework has been released. How many are working right now on the fifth homework, you know, have are, are started working on it? Okay, good, that's, that's nice. Don't, don't wait till the last minute. And solve lots of other problems, and uh, go to the TAs for help. They're there, you know, every day of the week, including weekends, and uh, it's all good. All right, we'll see you next time.